So welcome to session three, Origin of Life, right? So if you've been following along, we've had session one, two, and uh, this is the third one. It's following closely to a book based uh, Dr. Frank Turek and Norman Kiesler on I, do not have an, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. This is a great book, a uh, great follow for the layman uh, in the sense that it tells you about the science, tells you about the results of the science, but doesn't go super deep into the science. If you want to go deeper into the science, you know, I would look at the creator and the cosmos. Uh, this goes deeper into the science for the universe, creation of the universe, the expansion of the universe, the design of the universe, uh, and, and so forth. This book is also great in that it goes into a lot of the rebuttals from various uh, scientists and atheists. Another great uh, series that uh, some of this content, so I'm pulling content from all these various sources. Another great content here is uh, The Creator Beyond Time and Space. This is uh, through Dr. Chuck Missler, Dr. Mark Eastman. Uh, great series here. It's an audiobook. It's not a book format. It's an audiobook format. Uh, this one comes at the evidence, same scientific evidence, goes deeper into the evidence, but they make the assumption that you're already a, uh, a believer in a God, a believer in a, a Christian God. So it does have that, uh, that slant towards uh, the evidence, where the other two books, the previous ones, come at the materials as, you know, it doesn't matter uh, what your beliefs are, or religion are, they're just giving you this, the, the facts and the information. Uh, tonight you'll see me mention these two other books by Stephen Meyer. I'll talk into why uh, those are important there too, but you'll see some of uh, those come up as well. Signature in a Cell and Darwin's Doubt. So the outline we're following, <clears throat> again, follows the I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, uh, that, that loose uh, outline. In session one, we talked about what is truth and the cosmological argument. Session two, we talked about the theological argument and the anthropic principle. And then tonight, it's going to be more about the origin and the design of life. So let's do a quick review. Hopefully you've watched the previous two sessions. If you're just coming into this session, this third session now, you can watch this independent. You can watch each session independent of the others. Uh, but the idea is that they build off of each other uh, as, as we go on. So session one, we talked about what is truth and the cosmological argument, right? We narrow down that truth is absolute. It's true if it's absolute to all, all people, all times, and all places, right? That's something that's true. We also looked at why atheists and theist scientists believe in a, the universe at a beginning uh, based on the scientific evidence uh, using the acronym of SURGE uh, that Dr. Frank Turk likes to put out there helps us remember, you know, based on the second law of thermodynamics, the universe expanding, the radiation afterglow, galaxy seeds, and Einstein's theory of relativity, right? That, that time, matter, and uh, space all came into existence at once, right? So we know that everything that had a beginning had a cause. Uh, the universe had a beginning, therefore the universe had a cause. And then what was that called? Call? Something that was timeless, spaceless, all-powerful, uh, personal, because it had to be outside of our time domain in order to create the universe. Session two, we talked about the theological argument, meaning that the universe looks designed, and the anthropic principle, meaning the universe, not only does it look designed, it looks like it was built just for human life, specifically. And we covered how there's over a thousand fine-tuned parameters throughout the universe. Right? We went over some of these parameters, the expansion rate, the gravitational force, uh, the, the axle tilt of the Earth, uh, we went through, you know, 10 to the 40th. You took a ruler, stretched it across the known, the known universe, right? And you couldn't deviate from one inch of that ruler. That's be 10 to the 40th. So we looked at the high probability of having life uh, exist specific for humans here on Earth versus anywhere else. And if you were to change any of these values, no life would exist of any kind of anywhere. So again, if you want to more dive into those sessions, that's session one and session two. So session two, we talked about everything that has a design has a designer, as verified by the anthropic principle, right? The universe appears to be designed, therefore the universe had a designer, right? Second uh, evidence that we believe that there is a, a God out there outside of our time dimension. Now something I talked about last time that came up, I had a conversation with somebody, so I just at least wanted to cover this, is, you know, we talked about the probability of microbial life being found on other planets, right? It basically comes down to uh, no chance, right? Anything past the 10 to the 50th, uh, statisticians and scientists say that basically requires a miracle or it's, it's, it's not possible. And so microbial life lasting beyond 90 days, the probability is 10 to the 333rd. 
then it gets even um, uh, less, per, less probable, you know, going into higher life forms. But I did want to cover extraterrestrial life uh, real quick. So if you're unaware of it, meteorites, comets, they strike the Earth's atmosphere, the, the Earth's soil, and then they export that soil out through space. So astronomers have calculated that 200 kilograms of Earth's soil on average resides on every square kilometer of the moon's surface. Uh, 200, uh, 200 grams of Earth's soil resides on Mars' surface, right? Every square mile on Mars' surface. So it wouldn't be surprising to me if next week NASA comes and says, we discovered life on Mars, right? Microbial life and microbes. But from the data, right, the, well, the conclusion I would draw is that that life originated here on Earth. That life was brought there by the soil on the Earth. They find that um, the, pro the calculation is that there's some of Earth's soil everywhere uh, that's been spread out everywhere. So if they're, if eventually they're going to find some type of microbes on maybe Mars, right? But look at the data, right? Most likely they're going to realize that that start is the same. Something that we find Mars maybe originated uh, on Earth. Right? The possibility of that microblasting, long, a long period of time, not likely, but it could be maybe we do find something. And there's nothing in the Bible that prevents God from creating life elsewhere in the universe. There's nothing in the Bible that says there is no life out, uh, ever, everywhere else. It might make a little bit of some of the parts a little weird, because it kind of is weird if, if there are humans out elsewhere. Jesus came to earth to die for us and those humans. Like, did he go there too and then die again? Right, so it makes some things a little odd. I wouldn't, you know, maybe he made animals on other planets, but, you know, there's nothing. I don't believe there's life out there because of the, of the evidence I look at, but... If we did find if we did find extraterrestrial life, that wouldn't discount God, wouldn't discount the Bible in any way. All right, so tonight's about the origin of life. This is a single cell amoeba, a single cell amoeba. This is what uh, Charles Darwin says. We you know we all came from. We've all came from this uh, single cell amoeba. That this came into existence on its own. Uh, the origin of life spontaneously came into existence uh, with through natural causes, then eventually uh, formed us. Now, tonight's not about evolution. Uh, not, tonight's about the origin of life. Right? Next session, next month, we'll talk about the evolution. Um, and keep in mind something I want to remind everybody. Right? Science is the data. Science is the data that we're looking at. Scientists are the ones that interpret the data and give you their uh, conclusions right? with their world biases and views built in. So my goal is to show you the data and then you come to the logical conclusion. If you take out all your worldviews and all your biases, what's the logical conclusion you come to right, without uh, bringing your biases into it? All right, we'll talk more about that as well, later as well. So science is basically uh, the search for causes. Right? Science boils down to what is science, right? Science is ultimately the search for causes. Then there's two types of causes in science. There's non-intelligent, or AKA the natural cause, and then there's intelligent cause, right? So boil, everything boils down to what caused this event? What caused this thing to happen that we're looking into? Was it a natural, a natural cause or an intelligent cause? So let's look at some examples. Grand Canyon, right? How many think the Grand Canyon, raise your hand if you think the Grand Canyon happened through natural causes, meaning wind, rain, river, right, caused the Grand Canyon. How many, raise your hand if you think that. Now, raise your hand if you think it was an intelligent cause, meaning someone chipped it out specifically the way it is and built it specifically like that, right? And so, let's look at another one, right? So everyone agrees it's a natural cause, right? We, we, we believe the Grand Canyon happened through natural forms. Let's look at another example. Mount Rushmore. How many think this was a natural cause? That Wayne, Wren, Wayne wind storms caused the four president's head to, to, to carve itself onto the mountain? <laughs> One person raised their hand, just kidding, just kidding, right? Uh, how many of you think this is an intelligent cause? Right? All right, so everyone agrees it's an intelligent cause. Intelligent cause. How do you know the difference? Like, how do you know? How do you know that this was natural and this is intelligent? Right? How do we know that? Right? Well, there's a principle in science that is used called the principle of uniformity. Right? The principle of uniformity. And the principle of uniformity says the present is the key to the past. However it happens today is how it happened in the past. Right? Whatever happened in the past works the same as it does today. That's the principle of uniformity, that physics and nature exist, the way it exists today is the same way it existed in the past. So when you look at these images, right, 
you're using the principle of uniformity. What you're saying to yourself when you look at the Grand Canyon is, you've seen evidence of how nature works. You've seen if you pour water on a dirt pile, it, it makes a, a, a cavern. Right? You've seen where uh, water washes away over time against, against rock. You've seen the evidence of that. You've, you, can, you, can ex you can do this experiment and see that that happens. You've never seen a statue come into existence on its own. Right? If you were out in the middle of nowhere in the desert and you ran into a statue, you wouldn't think that, oh, this is the desert somehow just built, made this statue. It looks like a human. You would know that it came from an intelligent mind. You would know that somebody made it because you're using the principle of uniformity. You know, there's no evidence and no one's there's no proof to show that nature can just create a sculpture uh, in that way. So the goal tonight is to show you, right, this, quote, simple cell, which Darwin said, if this is a simple cell, which we realize it's not, if today it requires an intelligent designer, right, if we look at the simple cell and we realize today it requires an intelligent designer, then that means in the past it required an intelligent design or designer. Right? And that's the, the goal tonight, to show you the evidence. And you come to the conclusion that it works today the same as it did in the past. So life requires two things, <clears throat> software and hardware, right? Life requires software and hardware. Software or information is, the, is found in the language of DNA and the genome sequencing. We'll talk about that. The hardware is a chemical hardware. Life is made out of four major things, proteins. Proteins and the strands of amino acids, right? They make up the structure of your human uh, body parts. They provide the bones, the hair, they, they create the bones, the hair, the structure of, of your body, and they make up the majority of the hardware in the, in the human body. Early scientists recognized this, that proteins were needed in order to create life. Then you have DNA. DNA stores all the information necessary to produce the life forms. It right? has all the information for it. Then you have uh, RNA. RNA is created by DNA, and RNA takes the information from the DNA and uses that information to transfer to the new proteins, so the proteins know how to go create teeth and, and things like that and, and bones. And then you have the cell. The cell collapses all of these things together in like an envelope, right? And so the cell, without the cell, they would just you know goo, goo, goo apart and fall apart. All right, so these, these are the four things you need in order to have life. So how many have heard, raise a hand, right? How many have you heard of the primordial soup? Anyone heard of the primordial soup uh, through biology or through any, any, any past uh, text? So the primordial soup, if you go to some type of biology class or you remember in high school, it's been so long, right? It w was this theory that was proposed in the 1920s, right? They proposed that ultraviolet light acting on a primitive atmosphere uh, containing water and ammonia and methane produced oceans of this hot soup goop stuff and with all the building blocks of life, and over a billion years, randomly coming together over and over and over again, eventually produced life. Eventually produced the first reproducing, reproducing cell. Right? That's a primordial soup um, uh, theory. And you'll find it in textbooks as life originated from a primordial soup. And the textbooks will, will uh, promote this as fact, like as this is a known thing right? that we just believe. Now, look at the, some of the key things here. Uh, ultraviolet, light, ultraviolet light acting in a primitive atmosphere. Why do they say it's a primitive atmosphere? Because the atmosphere today, as we know, it has oxygen. Oxygen destroys proteins, destroys the building blocks of life. So you can't, if, in order to have the primordial soup create life out of spontaneously create life, you cannot have oxygen in the, in the air. Oxygen in the air. Well, uh, astro astronomy uh, and not astronomers but the, the in the atmosphere astrophysicists astro astro scientists have discovered that not only was there oxygen in the past there was more likely more oxygen in the past right there's actually there's more evidence to show that there was high amounts of oxygen in the past and we'll come back to this so keep that in mind right so 1920s oh it was a primitive atmosphere there's no science to back this up right it's just it was a theory and that randomly producing molecules of proteins came together and eventually formed the first cell, reproducing cell, and then life came out of that. So in 1953, Stanley Miller did an experiment uh, based on this theory. His professor urged him to, hey, you know what, do this experiment and see what you come up with. So he puts a bunch together, a, uh, together a bunch of flasks and he removes the oxygen out of the system. He sparks elect uh, electricity together 
and he does this experiment. And you would think from the news headlines and from what you see in the books that he created life in a lab. Right? You'll see that, and if, if you go back to your textbooks, you'll find this, this is proof of life. Uh, the building blocks of life created in the lab, right? Uh, so it proves evolution because through random sparks and random uh, actions, Stanley Miller produced life in a, in a flask, right? And initially, that's how it was touted. You'll still find it in biology books and textbooks today as, as fact, right? Building blocks of life. Let's look at uh, what was produced, because shortly after that announcement, they dug into, okay, what was really produced in that in that uh, vial. 80% of it was tar, 85% of it was tar, right? 13% of it was uh, carboxylic acids, both which are toxic to living uh, systems, right? Basically, it's, po it's poison, right? So 90, right, uh, it was a 97% or whatever that is, is, is poisonous, 98%. Small quantities of amino acids, so there was some small quantities of some proteins and glycine, and there was very trace amounts of some essential acids, amino acids. So you could say technically he built some proteins, so technically, yes, maybe uh, a protein or two that might be used in life could have been found in there. Let's, look, dig, let's dig in. What's the problems uh, with the analysis of this? Right? This is called the uh, spark and soup. This is called the... Uh, you might have heard to it not as the Stanley Miller experiment, but the uh, spark soup experiment, it might be called. So the first problem is a majority of the products of the, of the experiment are poisonous, right? 90x uh, percent of them were poisonous. And those poison, poisonous molecules more easily bind to the blocks of life than they do to each other, right? It's called an endothermic reaction if you're a chemist meaning in order for the poison to bond to each other, it required a substantial amount of energy. So it was a lot easier for all the poison just to bind to the blocks of life. So life can't exist, because the minute the poison latches on, it, it, it kills the blocks of life. Second, strong evidence exists, as I mentioned, that oxygen was abundant in the early Earth. Not even just abundant, but even more than uh, what we have today. And the building blocks of life would be destroyed. Right? So any type of formation of proteins, uh, oxygen would have destroyed it. So Stanley Miller's experiment doesn't represent uh, what the atmosphere would have been. Third, right, atmospheric scientists concluded. So now, if you take, uh, let's say you go back to primitive atmosphere of the Earth and you take all the oxygen out, which is what they have to do in order to say that this happened. The problem with that is oxygen is what blocks the ultraviolet light coming from the sun. Right? Uh, oxygen plays in a, role, in a, a role in that. Oxygen also helped keep the uh, other gases here on Earth, right? So, so astro, uh, atmospheric scientists concluded that the methane, ammonia, and the hydrogen in the atmosphere that they say you need in order to create uh, uh, blocks of life would have been destroyed in around 5,000 years due to the ultraviolet light radiation, right? So when evolutionists say, oh, billions and billions of years of this uh, primitive atmosphere, right, you can't have that much time, right? You only get around 5,000 years and then all the gases are gone. They've either been destroyed by ultraviolet light radiation or they've escaped the atmosphere, right? So, right, that's a, so, you, so you can't have uh, a long period of time in order to do this. Four, water is a major component in the experiment. Water causes DNA and RNA and proteins to break down, right? Water causes it to break down. Think about when you take a bath and your fingers get all wrinkly. Think about when you put water, something in water, it usually deteriorates. Water breaks down the um, blocks of life. So a major piece of the experiment, a major portion of the experiment in Stanley Miller's uh, goop is water. Right? And no one, to contrary belief, no one has ever produced the nucleotides or the building blocks of DNA. Right? Those were never found in any experiment, in his experiment, all the experiments done after that. Right? No one's ever produced the building blocks of, of DNA. And there's a sixth problem, right? This is a major problem. So the building blocks of life occur in right-handed and left-handed uh, amino acids, right? And what amino acid is, it's a chain of proteins. So a building block is one, one protein chained together with other proteins forms an amino acid. And so what you find is you find right-handed and left-handed amino acids. They're mirror images of each other. The experiment, Stanley Miller's experiment, and all the ones they've done after this, have equal amounts of 50-50 of left and right amino acids, right? So it has equal amounts of 50 of left and right. 
So if you have a, a, a soup of equal amounts of left and right proteins, amino acids, and you were to reach in and pull one out, you might get a left or a right. You pull the next one out, right? You maybe get another le left, pull the next one out, you get, another, you get a right. So as you pull them out randomly, you're gonna get a mix of left and right proteins. Does that make sense? Because it contains 50% uh, of each, right? Half and half. The problem with this is, right, scientists say, right, that all these proteins randomly were coming together and, and, uh, and over billions of years eventually form what's needed for the first uh, cell. All proteins in living systems are 100% only left-handed amino acids. You would have to randomly pull out only left-handed proteins and they would only bind to left-handed other proteins in order to get a protein or uh, in order to get an amino acid. Right? And DNA and RNA are 100% right-handed nucleotides, right? right-handed uh, amino acid proteins. So you can't, so when the scientists and the mathematicians get into this, right, it's, it's, it's uh, statistically impossible for you to randomly have proteins coming together and you only, only the left ones get to come together and only the right ones come together. That makes sense? Right, so that's like the final nail on this whole um, life created in a lab. This is such a big issue that in the early 1980s, uh, there was a symposium put together, a bunch of atheists and, and ev evolutionists, to figure out how, how could living systems come out of a soup uh, when they have to all be left-handed or right-handed. At the end of the symposium, it was determined that it was impossible. That chance chemistry cannot explain, uh, cannot explain it because DNA builds one block at a time, right? One block at a time. And if you insert one right-handed into an amino acid that's all left-handed, it, it basically destroys the function of the protein. So you can't, just ha you can't have one right-handed jump in there because it destroys the whole thing. They determined that the only way to always pull out the right one, the correct one, is to have, a bio is to have biochemistry experience meaning you have to have a brain or mind in order to know which ones to pull out, right? In order to know to, how to put them together, right? They, they, and this was a, the, the whole symposium was all just to figure this out. And note, even if they did create life in a lab, let's say in the future they're able to create, finally able to figure out how to create life in a lab and pull out all the right proteins. What does that show? It shows it still required an intelligent mind, somebody to do it, right? Not by, it's never gonna happen by random chance. Even in a lab, it's like maybe they create it in the lab, but some scientist is going to have to go in and manually connect all these things together and to, in order to create life, which they haven't been able to do. So that would just prove intelligent design even more. All right, so let's kind of move on to system design, right? Systems design. And you'll see how this comes together. So the ba most basic uh, system design of engineering, putting machines together in systems, is called an open loop system. This is an example of a watch. Right, a watch is an open loop system, it has gears, it has springs, it tells time, it tracks uh, the dates. Right? Uh, the next level up from that, even more complicated, is called a closed loop system, like the power steering on your car. Right? This is a vastly more complex than a watch. Right? It's a closed loop system. As you turn the wheel, the, the steering gets easier. Next level up from that of even more complexity in design is called an adaptive system. An example, your anti-skid brakes. Right, it measures the friction in the wheels, how they're faster spinning. It monitors that when maybe one wheel is spinning faster, and then it makes an adjustment based on uh, the information. It, it adjusts uh, aspects of the brakes. Right, so that's an adaptive system. Right, your wrist, the wrist in your human body, right, is more complex than a watch. Right, it's a complex closed loop system. It adapts and maintains to its ambient conditions. It fights off invaders and it's self-repairing, right? Your, your wrist is highly more complicated than these machines here. Next level up from adaptive systems are we get into intelligent machines, the computers, right? So if you look at a computer, the first next level up is a language processor, a machine that processes language. Now, if you pay attention, if you realize that if you build a machine to process language, what also do you need to have for that? You need to have the language. Right? And so the language itself and the machine have to be created basically at the same time or very close to each other or in coordination with each other because you need the machine to process the language, but you have to design the language for the machine. Right? So you're getting to another level of complexity of, of, of system design. Next level up is self-diagnostic machines. We, we have as, uh, as human societies, we have very primitive versions of this uh, through air, uh, uh, parity checks and stuff in computers. 
but a self-diagnostic machine to, to find the errors and, and fix it and kind of fix itself. DNA is far more advanced and does this far more effectively than we've ever any machine we've ever created. All right, next level up from that is a self-repairing machine. All right now that it's just diagnosed some issues, can it repair itself? All right, we don't have any machines that do this. We don't have any machines that we've ever created, not any serious ones, that are self-repairing. Right, yet yeah, DNA is a self-repairing system. And then the last one, next level up from that, of more complexity, is self-reproducing machines. Right? You've never seen two cars in a parking lot produce a baby car. Right? Machines just don't produce themselves, right? Uh, but yet, DNA right, far surpasses all these levels of design. Right? It's a self-reproducing, error code correcting, uh, self-diagnostic system. Right? It changes and adapts uh, its functions based on the needs. Right? It can change its uh, function based on the needs. So when Darwin said a simple cell, before he had the technology to look at the cell, that was what he based the origin of life off of, oh, you know, or an evolution off of. But we find that the cell is more complex than any man-made machine ever. It's the most complex system design machine. It's like a factory within the cell, within the cell membrane, the nucleus, and all the things it does. DNA copies itself to RNA, RNA transfers that information to proteins, and they all are dependent on each other, right? You can't have one without the other. So the cell is far from simple, the, uh, the cell in, a, in, li in, um, in life is far vastly more complex than anyone thought. So let's switch gears a little bit to information, right? Let's talk about information. Right, information versus random, right? Signal versus noise. If you have a radio and you have information, you're getting a signal. Otherwise, you get noise. Order versus chaos. Direction versus random walk. Control versus anarchy. Music versus a, uh, a cacophony and design versus chance, right? So what is information, right? If I show you this screen, right? Dots and dashes, anyone know what this is? Any guesses? Yeah, Morse code, right? So it's Morse code. Now, are the dots and dashes Morse code themselves, right? What is Morse code? Morse code is an agreement between two people that we're going to use these dots and dashes to represent letters. And if so, now that you have the letters of information, right, now you get it, now, now that you have the letters and you understand we have an agreement, now you can get information out of the dots and dashes. Anyone guess what the, the Morse code here says? Any guesses? SOS, that's right. Hey, help me. All right, so... Right? That, the information is something we have to come to an agreement on. Lang language comes from an agreement between uh, two people, uh, comes from an intelligent mind. I could, you could have knots on a rope, right? and that could mean something. Uh, you know, three knots means I'm in a uh, good mood, but two knots closer to the one side means I'm in a you know, not so good mood. Right? Once we have an agreement of what that is, we've contrived the origin of language, we've created an origin of language, then we can start sharing information back and forth. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? The letters in the alphabet. The letters themselves don't convey information. They're just letters. It's the arrangement, it's the agreed upon arrangement of the letters, and we've agreed what they mean that shares that information. Right? Language conventions are always the result of an intelligent design. Uh, what have I said to you guys? Uh, Bolak Nutuk. Bolak Nutuk. Bolak Nutuk. Right? You'd be like, what do you, this guy sounds crazy, right? So, but they're letters, you recognize their letters, you recognize their words, right? You notice the spaces, but you're not getting any information out of me. Bolak Nutuk, Bolak Nutuk, right? It's, it's, just, it's just letters, it's just words, right? So what have I said? Bo means to go or to leave, right? Luck means together, uh, new means to drink or to have, and tuck means coffee. Bullock new tuck? What am I saying? Let's go together and maybe drink some coffee. Right? Now you're getting information from me. Right? Now you're getting inf the information itself. Right? Bullock new jute. Let's go have a beer. Right? So now we have agreed upon language. So language convention always results in the mind and not by chance. You can't have an agreement of language by, by chance. Right? I bullock new tuck and by chance you know what I mean. We have to have that already instilled in us. And this is the one thing that uh, the evolution, evolutionary Darwinism uh, people, no one can answer this question. 
where is this information coming from in the, in the origin of life? Right? No one's been able to come up with the, no one even has a working theory of this. Right? So how about this? Natural or intelligent? All over the table is a bunch. So you, you come down in the morning and you see the dining room table and you notice there's alphabet serial letters all over the table. And you notice as you're, as you're passing the table, some words in there. Turn left at the light. Right, you guys see that? How did that happen? Was there an earthquake and the letters shook, 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 and then they just all lined up, turn left at the light? Do you think that's what caused this? Some wind came in through the window and moved some letters around? No, you know that it, it required an intelligent mind, right? If you, live, if you live with somebody, you know that it was your, you know, your kids or your spouse. If you live by yourself, you're freaked out right now and you're calling 911, right? Because you know that somebody came in your house and did this, right? There's no way this happened by chance, right? And this is the same thing we see in DNA. DNA has four letters of its alphabet, but based on the sequencing, it has a punctuation, the start and stop. The RNA cells know what to do. It can, based on the sequencing, it knows what it needs to produce, right? DNA is exactly like a, an advanced language system, right? So there's language here in DNA. You need a prior agreement to it. You need, some, you need something to put in place. This is how to understand the information. This is how you translate that language. Otherwise, it's just letters and, you know, uh, there's no information being conveyed. Uh, Bill Gates says DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. DNA far more advanced than anything Microsoft's ever put together, than anything Google's ever done, Facebook's ever done, right? More complicated than any software program ever put together, right? DNA is a message, right? And one amoeba, and just one single cell amoeba, it's like a thousand volumes of an encyclopedia. Right, you can line up several hundred amoebas in an inch, right? And how do we know this? Richard Dawkins tells us this. Leading atheist, right, in his book, some species of the unjustly called primitive amoebas have as much information in their DNA as a thousand Encyclopedia Britannica. Where, where did that come from? Like, how do you get a thousand books of information in a DNA? Right, it's, uh, it'd be like the, um, I think Frank Turk likes to say, the, li the Library of Congress. Randomly, all the books came together and all the letters came together and you have information. Let's look at the human DNA. Human DNA is 3.5 billion letters long, right? How did that come together by chance? And if you put it in any other order, it must be in the right order, it's, it becomes it deadly, it becomes lethal, right? It's like software code, right? And in your human body, across your whole human body, you have enough information, enough books, uh, information for enough books to fill the entire Grand Canyon 50 times. Think about that. That's how much information is in your body. You could fill the Grand Canyon 50 times of, with books in order to catch up to how much data is in, is information stored in, inside you. Some people like to say this, this is the God of the gaps theory. That means that we don't know how the origin of life came into existence, so we're just throwing God in there for now until we figure it out, and then we'll make fun of you for saying it's God. All right, this is not a God of the gaps theory. We're not arguing from what we don't know. We're arguing from what we do know. We see a message. You can't have language by chance. All right, this is not a God of the gaps theory. This is a, someone put turn left at the light in my, in my, my uh, cereal. I don't need to know uh, how they did it. I just know that you cannot do that unless you have an intelligent mind. So Stephen Meyer has his book, I mentioned it earlier, Signature in the Cell. It's a 600-page book. I have it at home. I have not read the whole thing because I'm like, it's 600 pages, right? So, <laughs> but it's a really thick book. He tried all various possible ways that life could have come into existence by natural forces. Right? What are all, could, could, um, could life have come into existence by some natural force? And he tried 600 pages worth of data and research, you can look into it, of of trying to see if this is possible. Right, his conclusion, which I paraphrased here because it, it's a little bit longer, but its conclusion is, uh, I mean, I need to paraphrase it, shorten it down. Uh, our experience affirms that specified information, no matter where it comes from, hieroglyphics, a book, radio signal, or a simulation experiment, always arises from an intelligence source from a mind and not strictly material process. Right? Meaning you cannot get information, right? No matter what you try, you cannot get information by natural causes, right? By chance alone. You have to have uh, some type of intelligence source or some type of intelligent mind 
to put that in place. So there's also a chicken egg scenario issue, a right, chicken egg scenario. So the, the proteins, in order to be made, need DNA. DNA, in order to be made, needs proteins. Uh, DNA, in order to be made, needs RNA. RNA needs DNA. Uh, in or a cell, in order to be made, needs RNA. And a, I mean, a RNA needs a cell, and a cell needs RNA. A cell needs proteins in order to be made. Proteins need a cell. Proteins need RNA to be made. RNA needs proteins. DNA needs a cell to be made. A cell needs DNA to be made. You see the problem here? You cannot gradually grow into this. You have to have it all at once. That, without all of it at once, you can't create life. Right? You can't, so even in the primordial soup, right, they've never created the building blocks of DNA. But you still need proteins, DNA, you need cells, you need RNA. This is called the irreducible complexity. Right? You have to have all the pieces at once. All right? You can't gradually build to life. You've got to have all the pieces in place at once. Right? And that's, what, that's, what, that, that's the other issue that we show here. So let's look at the data. Right? The data of a single cell. Thousand volumes of an encyclopedia. All right? uh, more complex than any man-made machine. Has an irreducible complexity. All the pieces have to be there at once. It's an error correcting digital code. More complex, you know, than, you know, super, very complex. Can't happen by randomness. And I'll show you the, the statistical numbers uh, later. Uh, requires a designed language. Can any known force do this? No. Right? So, well, what does the data say? Right? Again, science is the data, scientists translate the data. So if you came at this with no preconceived worldviews, how would you interpret this data, right? What's the most reasonable conclusion? That it spontaneously came together or that someone designed it that way? Both sides have equal burden of proof. Atheists must support why it is more likely that life arose by natural forces. Theists must support why it is more likely that life arose by intelligent design. Natural forces do the same thing over and over again. They do not provide messages. They do not provide messages. There are only four known natural forces in the universe. So these four natural forces had to have somehow created life, right? Gravity, electromagnetic forces, and the strong and weak nuclear forces. That's it. Those are the only four known natural forces in the universe. And somehow those need to have created spontaneously life all at once. So Darwinism has to answer, where did those natural forces come from? Right? Where did the universe come from? Why does it appear designed? Right? We talked about this in the first couple of sessions. Where did the first life come from using those natural forces? And where does subsequent life come from? There's not even a known working theory for the origin of life. They don't even have a known working theory. They just, they just don't know. Right? So for formula for life for evolution, matter plus energy, plus chance chemistry equals life. Intelligent design is matter plus energy plus information equals life. So I have a short video here, I'll play in a second. So Richard Dawkins, right, he's, um, you know, he even says DNA looks like a computer program. Uh, he says life looks designed. And so Ben Stein here is, it's from a movie called um, Expelled. And the movie's not about the origin of life. The movie's more about any intelligent design professor in a, in a university that have been kicked out. They've all been kicked out or expelled for even suggesting intelligent design. And so Ben Stein's interviewing Dawkins, and he's asking him, well, you know, where's the origin of life coming from? So I'm going to play the clip here in a second. So pay attention to, you know, Dawkins' answer, what, what he says uh, about the origin of life. Well, then who did create the heavens and the earth? Why do you use the word who? You see, you, you, you immediately beg the question by using the word who. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. What was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, and how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. 
So you have no idea how it started? No, no. No, no, no has anybody. Nor has anyone no. else. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry and molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. All right. So what is the answer to intelligent design here on Earth? Uh, maybe aliens seeded the Earth. Dawkins recognizes that there's intelligent design in life, so much so that maybe other ex extraterrestrial life planet seeds here on Earth. What's the problem with this answer? Who created the aliens? <laughs> right? He's just disconnecting the question one level away, right? So, right, the intelligent design, the design is so apparent in, in, the, um, in the blocks of life and the origin of life that that's how they've answered that question. That other aliens have come, seeded life on Earth, and that's how life got here. Uh, Dr. Frank Tarek, Tarek tells a story. So, uh, just go back. So, doc, so, Richard Dawkins, atheist, is okay with intelligent design, but not if it's God, right? Intelligent design is okay, but not if you bring in God into it. So, Dr. Frank Tarek tells a story of a, a, a Ron, Ron Carlson. Ron Carlson, he used to go around the college campuses and present why Darwinism is wrong and why intelligent design appears right. Uh, so a biology professor invited him, uh, Ron, to give his lecture at it with his students. Ron comes, gives his lecture. Afterwards, Ron asks the professor over lunch what he thought. Uh, the professor says, well, I think what you say is right, but I'm going to keep teaching Darwinism, Darwinism anyway. And Ron says, why would you do that? The professor says, because if it's true we came from silly algae, then I can sleep with whoever I want, and it's morally comfortable. Right? That's the real issue when it comes down to, you know, it can't be God. Because it's not about the science anymore. It's about they don't want there to be a God. Because that opens up a bunch of other issues. Right? Then are we morally accountable, etc. So it's just interesting that even you know, Dawkins says it's, it's, it's maybe alien seeded life here. So because it can't come through random chance, what do they uh, suggest to try to solve it, but we need more time. We need billions of years, billions and billions of years in order to eventually, randomly, we spontaneously created a life. Nature disorders over time, right? Nature doesn't order things. Law, second law of thermodynamics, right? Nature disorders over time. Given enough time, things do not come into order. They get worse, right? Non-living things, anyway, get worse. Living things can bring some appearance of order because we take in energy and use that to produce some order. But non-living things randomly coming together in a, in a hot soup is not going to become not going to get more orderly. Right? There's an example of uh, in the I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. If if a plane flying over your house a thousand feet high dropped red, white, and uh, blue confetti out of the plane, right? What are the chances of that confetti landing in and on your yard and forming the the uh, United States flag, right? Spontaneously. Oh, that can't happen, right? Oh, well, given enough time, eventually it could. All right, so now we fly the plane at 10,000 feet, and we drop the confetti. Or 20,000 feet, we drop the confetti. More time is not going to solve the problem. More time makes it worse. Right? It becomes more disordered. Atheists and theists have calculated the probability of life to virtually zero, uh, coming spontaneously by chance. The chance of getting one protein molecule, just one, would be the same as a blindfolded man finding one marked grain of sand in the Sahara Desert three times in a row. Right? That'd be the chance of, find, uh, of building one protein. You need life, you need 200 of these. <laughs> right? So 
you'd have to find that same grind of sand, I guess, like, you know, 600 times or, or, or but a lot more times than, than three times. Right, so chance is not a cause. Chance is just a word we use when we don't know what the variables are or what really happened. So a reminder, we talked about a little bit about this last time. Right? These numbers like 10 to the 17th and 10 to X, they're kind of hard to us to picture in our heads sometimes. So remember that we, we talked about this in session two, right? 10 to the 17th, doesn't sound that big. It's huge. There are 10, only 10 to the 17th seconds in the known universe it's from the beginning of time. 10 to the 17th number of seconds. 10 to the 40th, where right, we went over this last time. You stretch a ruler across the known universe, right? Across the known universe, you stretch out a ruler, and for example, the gravitational force, even though it's not measured in inches, it would have to be within one inch of that measurement. That's 10 to the 40th. Chances for getting proteins uh, in an amoeba by chance, 10 to the 40,000, right? By, uh, calculated by uh, Fred Hoyle. Chances of build, getting a single cell organism with all the building blocks, 10 to the 100 billion. Right? Anything past 10 to the 50 is considered uh, a miracle or considered uh, basically virtual zero. Right? This is craziness right? to think that that happened by chance. Like, how do you know? Like, the more I dig into this, it's just like, how is this even in our textbook still? Right? There, uh, in the, um, November. Uh, I think 20, I want to say 2016, 2015, uh, the uh, Royal Society of UK uh, got together. Uh, they're, they're a group of, uh, they look into science and stuff like that, and they got together about the evolutionary theory because they realized that it's starting to fall apart. And so they had a whole gathering of like, what do we do about this and how do we try to save it? Because they realized that the this sci this sciences, as more discoveries keep happening, it's, put, it's, it's being more and more apparent that evolution is just something that we're really dragging along with us that's harder and harder to uh, back up. So one versus the other, right? When you talk about evolution and you talk about uh, intelligent design, right, what, is it, what does it become? Oh, it's science versus religion. Oh, that's not, you're just bringing religion into this. And, or it's faith versus reason. I could see this if you're a, a religious-based person, like Christian-based person, and you don't have the information, but you know, then yeah, it might sound like, well, I, I don't believe in that because I, I believe in X, right? And without any information to back it up, it might come across that way. Um, but once you start digging in and looking into the information, you realize it's not about science versus religion. It's not about faith versus reason. It's about good science versus bad science, right? Good science versus bad science. So why? Uh, what's bad science? They force their philosophy on the data. They ignore the evidence for design. They come into, you know, they come into the um, evidence already assuming intelligent design is not even possible, right? So they're not objective to when they look at the data. And so they just, they like, well, it can't be intelligent design. So now we gotta try to find other ways to explain the data. And you'll see in uh, Richard Dawkins in his book, he goes through this, basically summarizes of we can't mention God or we can't mention that it could be an intelligent designer because we don't want to give God a foot in the door. Because the minute we give him a foot in the door, then it, it'll ruin the whole thing you know, over time. Right? It's about reasonable faith versus unreasonable faith. Right? It's about reasonable, reasonable faith versus unreasonable faith. <clears throat> so Richard Dawkins says, Biology is a study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. He says that. And then he talks, later he talks about the human uh, body, the intricate architecture and precision engineering in human life and in each of the trillion cells within the human body. So if you're, an observ if you're, a, uh, if you're a, a scientist and you're observing the data, right, he says, having been designed for a purpose. That's what it appears like. Yet he refuses to allow observation to interfere with his conclusion. Right? Because he's, he's already come to the table with the conclusion. Well, it's not intelligent design. Oh, it looks design, acts design, uh, appears design, right? Quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, looks like a duck, it must be an owl. Right? It's just like, it's kind of, it's, it gets to the point where it's a little absurd. Right? Uh, Fra Francis uh, Crick is an atheist as well. Uh, he says, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what the, he's a co, this is a co-discoverer of, of DNA. Biologists must, uh, uh, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. So think about that. He's, they, biologists have to constantly keep in mind 
I know what you're looking at, but it's not designed. It's evolved. I know it looks designed, but it's not. Right? Uh, founder, godfather of intelligent design, um, Philip Johnson says, based on Frank's, uh, Francis's quick uh, memo to his biologists, Darwinian biologists must keep repeating that the reminder to themselves, uh, that, that reminder to themselves, because otherwise they might become conscious of the reality that is staring them in the face and trying to get their attention. Right? So this is what you see in biology books. This is what you see in the education system. It's like, even though none of the data really supports it, it's, this is true, right? Or this is, this is the conclusion. It cannot be intelligent design, even though uh, uh, the observation uh, shows that. So summary and, and uh, conclusions, kind of summarize this up. So one, life does not consist of merely chemicals, but also, but also specified complexity in information. Right? So you have to have the information. It's not just a random chance of chemicals. You need the language and the information to go with it. There are no known natural laws that can create the specified complexity of information or information. The simplest life contains information for a thousand Encyclopedia Britannicas. Science is a search for cause built on philosophy, right? And there are only two types, natural and intelligence, intelligent design. Darwinians, Darwinians rule out intelligent design, intelligent design before even looking at the evidence, right? It's ruled out before they even look at the data. They come into it knowing, okay, it'd be that, right? So it appears design, looks design, but it's not design by chance. There are not even known scientific theories of the origin of life. And spontaneous generation of life has never been observed right, or shown that's true. Right? It's believed by faith. Right? They believe this through faith. It's about reasonable faith versus unreasonable faith. I don't have enough faith to believe that life came by way of random chance in a primordial hot soup. I don't, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And that's it. All right, thank you guys very much. So this is some of the references, if you're interested. Signature in the cell and Darwin's doubt, I'd only get those if you're interested in going deeper into the um, science and the chemistry and uh, things like that. Uh, Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist is the book I'd recommend if you're just starting out and you need a layman's version of uh, some of the content you've seen tonight. So tonight was Origin of Life, and next month uh, we're looking to do the macro evolution. Uh, we'll have Kelly presenting, I think, as well, maybe myself too. Um, and again, maybe check out some YouTube channels if you're interested in more information. cross exam is really good. Uh, Dr. William Lang Craig, uh, Dr. Craig videos is good, right? And then uh, our channel as well. And so for questions, we're going to take questions on YouTube. So we're now going to open up for Q&A. Uh, live question streaming is going to be YouTube and Facebook, correct? So post your questions on YouTube and Facebook. Give us a second to uh, bring those over to, you know, they're going to be sent to me up here. Uh, I might answer some of them. Uh, we have Pastor Joe might answer some of them. And we're going to open it up for uh, questions. All right. Thank you guys very much. So wait for some questions to come through. They're going to come through now. So as I wait for the questions to come through, I'll kind of just, you know, it's been interesting as I dig more and more into the science and the data. It's just staggering amount of information that, that um, that's just ignored or or, or biasly concluded uh, based on observation. One thing I'll say that fascinating computers, you talk about computers and then like a computer that can heal itself or like a computer that can heal Yeah, self repairing, yeah. So the, so the computer is kind of getting to that point where you can Well, we're, we have self diagnostic machines. We can do self like self diagnostic, self diagnostic, self diagnostic machines. Uh, we can do some minor error, uh, error repairing of information. What we can't create is um, error uh, self-repairing machines that just fix themselves, uh, things like that. All right, so I have a question here. So it's um, the plain reading of Joshua 10, 12 through 13. This is my, I mean, yeah, my new joke for this. Yeah, and how that relates to the standard cosmology and centrism. So let's see. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and, your, and you moon in the valley of... So I remember this. So this is where the sun, the sun stood still uh, for a number of days. This is interesting that this is brought up. This is... Um, Dr. Chuck Missler actually talks about this, goes into this. Now, can't be proven, um, but there is a theory that... 
you know, think, if you think about the, the, the God knew what was going to happen before it happens. Right? So I remember uh, reading about something that scientific theory that the Earth's axle tilt uh, was slightly different by a, a few uh, a smaller amounts, and that what how you could do this, like basically how could scientifically make the Earth the sun stand still scientifically, is that at the moment that happened, the Earth actually adjusted its tilt into the tilt it is today. And by adjusting its tilt, the sun would have appeared to be still for that moment, for that, for that moment of time. Um, so is it true or not? I don't know. Uh, but scientifically, is it possible? Yes. That's how it would be possible. Is that at the same, at that moment, if the Earth's tilt adjusted, because uh, it can't be way off, because otherwise life ceases to exist. But, right, if it did tilt in some amount, that would keep, the sun would stay still in that, in that view. So, I don't, that's the closest I get to that, to that answer, if anyone. But, um, look into uh, Dr. Chuck Missler, I think, I'm not sure if it's his Mars uh, top, trop, topical study, or if it's creation of the universe topical study. It might be his, bio, he goes to the whole Bible, so if you go to the Joshua, his book on Joshua, He'll probably go into that then. So this is a more of a, might be more of a question for Joe. Um, Pastor Joe, how do I start a conversation with a non-believer about creationism, creationism, cre, cre, I can't even talk, talk today, uh, creationism versus evolution? How do we have a conversation with non-believer about creation, cre, creationism versus evolution? I give you my thoughts. I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, so I don't come at it with the religious aspect, right? Because no one wants to talk about God and religion a lot of times. So I come at it of as, at the data. So usually when I mention to people, I'm like, "Hey, I just I'm just presenting a bunch of data. Have you seen the data for uh, why you know we don't believe some of us don't believe in evolution, or why we believe it it was a uh, uh, creationism?" And usually the answer is no. And then I'll try to give out some of that data. So I'm hoping with these sessions that we're arming those that are interested with session one, session two. But this is something you really want to be able to start. Watch the sessions a couple times. Just remember the information. Um, maybe watch some of the you know, cross-examine uh, videos as well. Because if you, if you watch it a couple times, this is kind of how I got started is I used to listen to this stuff and watch this stuff several times over and over again. And you start remembering uh, that data, that information. But I come at it as, hey, you know, what do you mean by evolution? Someone says, well, I believe in evolution. First is, what do you mean by that? Because they're talking about microevolution. Microevolution is true. That means variations within the same species. But they're talking about macroevolution. Well, wh what data do you have to back that up? All right. So usually I like to start with that. It's, the, it's from that book, Tactics. It's, what do you mean by evolution? So tell me what you mean. And then once I understand what you're saying, if they are talking about macroevolution, but make, put the burden on them, not on you. You don't need to prove that um, creationism is true. They need to prove why evolution is true. Why do you believe in macroevolution? You know, I read about this, the primordial soup experiment. All right, well, let me give you some data on that. Uh, why else do you believe? Why believe whatever fossils and Neanderthal heads were found, right? Well, I can provide data to that as well. So ask them what they mean by evolution and ask them to explain, back up their theory. Why is it true, why is it true for them? And that's how I usually get started. I don't know if you want to add anything, but. That's good. Yeah, as Pastor Joe says, build relationships and the credit. You know, if they get to know you, then know you become creditable um, in your answers. Probably harder with a stranger, right? All right, we'll give a, you know, we'll give some time on the Q and A because I think last time somebody submitted a question and we had just ended <laughs> the stream, so we'll give some time there. So yeah, next session will be, as I wait for questions to come in, next session will be about, we're going to talk about evolution. Um, Kelly will get into that. And just the data behind evolution. Now, if evolution is true, let's say evolution is true, that doesn't disprove God. Right? It doesn't disprove God in any way. That just, anything, it, it reinforces that intelligent design because of the, the, the things you need in place uh, to even have evolution. But I think that you'll, you'll be surprised on the data that we talk about next time. Again, YouTube, Facebook, you can post your questions there.
Uh, post comments too. It'd be nice to know if, like, you know, if this is something that you find interesting or enjoyable, or any suggestions you have for the presentations uh, format as well. Yeah, and that's a good point. I'm not sure if I gave my background because yeah, my background is in IT. You know, so it's not you know, as an IT guy. Yeah, I like logical things that make logical sense, right? So. Yeah, super basic compared to your body. There's one thing I want to share. You just reminded me. I meant to um, add a slide for this, and I, was, I thought about it last night, and I totally forgot. If um, information, right? If you take a CD, which I should have brought a CD, but I don't know if you guys remember CDs, right? Music CDs or, or computer disc CDs or floppy disk, whatever you take. If you take a CD and you weigh it on a scale, right? Dr. Chuck Mister talks about this. How much does that CD weigh? I think it's like 0.1 gram or something, right? That CD weighs, we'll just say 0.1 gram. I'm not sure the exact uh, weight of it. Uh, you weigh that CD, put it at 0.1. You then take um, 5 million uh, piece, bytes of data and you put it on the CD and from information. You fill that CD with 5 million bytes of data on the CD and then you weigh it out again on the scale. How much does it weigh? The same, 0.1 gram or whatever that is, right? It weighs the same. Information itself is not, um, is not matter. Information itself is, is not matter, right? It's the, it's, so if it's not matter, that means it's timeless. It's immaterial. You can transfer it through the air, right? Information through the air. It's timeless, it's immaterial. That means the information lasts forever. If your body is a machine, you the person are the information in this machine, right? If you cut off your arm and replace the organ, that's still you, right? What makes you you? It's not the body parts of your body, right? It's that, what we call the soul, right? Your soul is information that's stored on this body, in this human body. And so whether you like it or not, you are eternal because you're, 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 you yourself are information. You're not the body itself. The body dies, but the information la lives on, right? The, the thing that makes you you, the soul, is not material. So that means it's timeless. Right? And so you are eternal whether you like it or not. Um, so it's just a matter of where do you spend that, uh, where do you spend that eternity. But it's just, it was kind of, um, you know, interesting, right? Uh, 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 when, I, when I discovered that, it's like you are information. The real you is, is, is data, right? It's not the body parts, right? Information is immaterial because it's, it's like you can put all information on a CD and it's, it still weighs the same. There's no, there's no, it's the, it's the, um, arrangement of that of that data, arrangement of that uh, piece, but you can transfer it across the air, right? So if you think of Wi-Fi, the data going through the air, right? It's not, it's not material, so it's, it's timeless. Um, interesting, another interesting thing is, uh, you know, in Genesis, you know, we'll talk about more biblical things in the later sessions, but Genesis, right, God raised, created Adam out of the dust. And if you analyze the dust in the ground and you analyze the human body, the same 17 components and, and molecules that make up the human body are the same 17 components found in the dirt, right? It's the same, it's like we're made out of dirt, like the same things you find in dirt are the same thing, the same things that are made, the human body makes. So it's just, it's kind of interesting. How long would it have taken to form the Grand Canyon? Oh, good question. Thousands or millions of years? I'm not a component of millions of years for things. Um, so I can't give you like the, I mean, I wasn't there uh, to give you that straight answer. Uh, what I can do is when we talk about uh, the next session, because I still have to go back to the carbon dating, which I plan to cover that in the evolution piece, I'll, look, I'll, I'll bring this into light too. But if you look at the Grand Canyon, it's interesting, uh, some light information I, ha I have on that, right? I don't think it was millions of years, but if you count the flood as true, if you count aspects of uh, things through history. The flood, there's a lot of science to back up that the flood really happened. I mean, you find, you find animal fish bones on top, of, as you climb up Mount Everest, you find fish bones on the way up there that you have to dodge. Like, why? How did, how did they even get up there? Unless there's a worldwide flood. 
you find um, fish and like lions and things like uh, bones of fish and lions all together in like in a cave high up in the in the atmosphere. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting that there's a lot of science behind the flood. So the flood could have played a played a huge part in the Grand Canyon. And I remember seeing something where it was how long scientists think those layers formed in the Grand Canyon aren't as long as we not as um, doesn't take as long as we actually think that millions of years, right? It could be done in thousands of years. If you, even if you look at something like the uh, the Dead Sea, I think fit, I remember taking one to the Dead Sea in the, by Israel, and we were on a bus, and they had a, someone had drawn a black line across the mountain, and we're on the bus, and they were like, "Oh, you see that line right there?" And we're like, "Yeah," and then they're like, "Look where the Dead Sea is." It was Dead Sea was way down, really tiny, far, far away, and this line was right up here by the bus. And they were like, 50 years ago, the water line was up to there. Right? Within 50 years, it had drained all the way down to um, near the bottom of the, the Dead Sea. So it's kind of amazing how, you know, you would think, oh, that took, you know, thousands of years or millions of years. So I can't answer that specifically. I'll look into it for you. Um, but I, I don't think it's millions and millions of years. That's just me personally, but I can't answer that straight forward. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, and if you think of like, you know, if Christianity is true and the, 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 the resurrection is, if that's true and the resurrection is true, God doesn't need your body to remake you, right? If you think of, a, of a information of letters, I don't need, I can use, if I was to use the word apple, A-P-P-L-E, I don't need that specific A. I need any A will do, any P will do, any another P, any L, any E. Um, you find that DNA is the same way. You don't need your specific body. He just needs the same letter makeup, which is information. And if, if, resurrection, if Christianity is true and the resurrection is true, God just has to arrange the letters in the same way to create your body and put you, you, know, and put you, put you into it. So it's kind of uh, interesting with the information. Yeah. All right, so any more questions? Don't look like any more questions. All right, well, that's it for session three. Uh, appreciate your time. Uh, so tune in next month for session four. We'll talk about evolution. And I'm going to answer, hopefully, the non-carbon dating, the carbon dating question uh, next month as well. All right, thank you, guys. Appreciate it.